Sri Lanka is a tiny island country in the Indian Ocean that packs a huge punch when it comes to things to see and do. From beautiful beaches and coconuts by the sea to ancient civilizations and incredible natural wonders, this place has it all. We are Marika Nasse and as you hopefully have already seen on our channel, we spent around two months in Sri Lanka and explored as much as we could. Now we are confident in sharing with you our suggested itinerary for a dream trip to this tropical paradise. We have so much to pack into this video, so we will start right at the beginning. Your trip to Sri Lanka will likely begin as you arrive into the country's main international airport of Bandaranaike. Do not make the mistake of thinking that this is in the capital of Colombo. It is in fact about an hour north of Colombo on the outskirts of another city called Nagombo. Like us, you will probably need a visa to come to Sri Lanka. You can get it on arrival at the airport, which costs $50, or you can buy it online in advance and it is $10 cheaper. In this itinerary, we are going to be heading south along the southern beaches, then looping up and around and coming back to Negombo at the end for a flight out of Sri Lanka. But it's worth noting that you can do this itinerary in the completely opposite direction if you want. So, we headed southwards first and to get to our first destination of Gal, we suggest booking an airport transfer or getting a taxi or Uber to Colombo Fort Railway Station and from there you can take the scenic train journey south. We will talk about train journeys a little bit later, but this route from Colombo to Gal is one of the most scenic we've ever been on as the tracks are right by the ocean for a lot of the two hour journey. This sounds obvious, but sit on the right hand side of the train for the best views. We based ourselves near Unabatuna and rented a scooter to drive around the coast and see what we could find. Gali Fort, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, is a well-preserved colonial era fort that dates back to the 16th century. It boasts charming cobblestone streets, Dutch and British colonial architecture, and a rich history with a vibrant cultural scene. Gal is where we had our first go at the local cuisine and what better way to get to grips with curry culture than to order 10 curries all at once. This sign saying 10 curries for 10 euro certainly caught our attention and it did not disappoint. It's common to be served several different curries and then you are supposed to mix them all together with rice and some bowl to get the full experience. Throughout our time in Sri Lanka we found dal or lentil curry, chicken curry, eggplant curry and potato curry to be the nicest. Other common curries include jackfruit curry, pineapple curry and beetroot curry. Sri Lankan cuisine is known for its vibrant flavors, aromatic spices and diverse range of dishes. Apart from rice and curry, some other other popular dishes are hoppers, which has crispy breakfast pancakes, kotu roti, which is chopped roti mixed with vegetables, eggs and or meat, some bowls, which are side dishes made from grated coconut mixed with chili, lime and other ingredients, and devil dishes, which are stir-fried meat and vegetables made in a spicy sauce. Eating out in Sri Lanka is generally very affordable, so you shouldn't miss out on the chance to test out the delicious cuisine. Univatuna is brimming with life. We love the one-dimensional layout of this town. The street is riddled with chilled beach bars and quaint cafes where you can sip on a coffee or some fresh coconuts. All along the shore you will find restaurants and bars that have their own area of beach chairs and tables at which you can sit back and soak it all in. The Lavelle Beach is a must visit if you fancy a really special experience. Arrive early in the morning and enjoy a relaxing swim with sea turtles. We came here a few times around 7 a.m. in the morning and we had the place to ourselves. Just us and the sea turtles, of course. As two people who just adore anything to do with animals and wildlife, these were among our favorite moments of our trip. Other beachy places along the dreamy coast include Ahangama, where we went a few times to a place called Cactus and enjoyed stunning views and delicious coffee, Willigama, which is a renowned surfing hotspot, Tangale, which is a bit further east and is a quiet retreat away from the hustle bustle, and not forgetting another one of our favorites, Marissa, which is probably the most famous beach town in the country. Marissa is a laid-back coastal haven that's all about good vibes and tropical 
natural charm. The beach is a lengthy stretch of golden sand, complemented by an abundance of lush palm trees along the bay, creating the perfect escape by the Indian Ocean. You'll find a mix of beachside shacks and cozy cafes to observe the surfers and swimmers and the waves dancing along the shore. Marisa is actually one of the only places in the world where you can go on a sea safari to see blue whales. But we actually didn't go whale watching because we learned that due to the heavy rainfall there is a very slim chance of actually seeing them and we were advised against it by our hotel owner whose brother is a captain of a boat because he said they haven't seen any whales in two days. So next time. <laughs> Those whale watching tours cost around about 40 euro we think so uh, keep that in mind if you find yourself in Marissa and fancy doing a spot of whale watching. We mentioned that we rented a scooter to see most of these places, but Marisa and Tangali were a bit out of range for our little bike. So after we had given the bike back, we used the public bus system and stayed in Marisa and Tangali for a couple of nights each. The public bus system in Sri Lanka is very affordable. We mean like a less than a year for a bus journey. One time you paid eight cents to go on quite a long journey, like two kilometers. If you're looking to hop from place to place along the south coast, basically you just have to get yourself to the main road, find a bus stop and hop on any bus going in the direction you want to go and tell the driver where you want to get off. Getting buses anywhere in Sri Lanka is really cheap and really convenient, so that is a great option of how to get around. If you want to get a little bit more off the beaten path and go to places that maybe nobody's ever heard of or try to find your own little hidden gems then doing what we did and renting a moped is also a pretty good choice so it's really up to you. Another way of doing it is getting tuk-tuks from one place to another. It's gonna cost you a little bit more expensive but it's also a fun way of traveling. We are told to expect to pay around 100 rupees per kilometer. But you will find that the tuk-tuk drivers try to squeeze as much money out of tourists as possible so they'll definitely charge more than what it should be, so make sure not to get scammed into paying too much. If a tuk-tuk driver offered us a fair price from the beginning, then we would end up giving them a little tip just to th say thank you because they were nice, but if they told us a price that was too high, we would bargain them down a bit and then not give them a tip because they tried to scam us. To know what prices should be, you can use the app called PickMe. This is kind of Uber in Sri Lanka. Unfortunately, a lot of tuk-tuk drivers don't really like using it, so it's, there is a very slim chance that you will actually get a tuk-tuk or a taxi uh, using this app because they just try to do it the old way uh, by getting their clients on the road. I think they can get more money out of tourists if they don't. <laughs> how much it should cost, mm -hmm. so they don't like using pick me. One last thing about southern beaches, if you do decide to rent a moped, you will find some off the beaten path beaches that are really beautiful and they might look like they're a great swimming spot, but just be careful, listen to locals if they tell you not to swim because there can be some dangerous riptides and currents. There was one beach that we went to and a local told us that a Russian guy had died a few days before by swimming in the sea and getting mm -hmm. stuck. So if a local advises against swimming in the sea, just listen to them and as always safety comes first so just make sure what kind of water you're getting into. Anyway, after finally letting go of the beach vibes in Tangali, we made our way via public bus to have a very special experience at Yala National Park. As we have already made a full video on our wild adventures at Yala, we won't go into too much detail here, but if you are interested in learning about our stay in a luxury tent, those all good tents should have, this is our living room. And a very rewarding private safari tour, be sure to check out that video after this one. Mm. Our next stop after Yala was in Udawalawe. Udawalawe National Park is the number one place in Sri Lanka that people go to in the hope of spotting herds of wild elephants. For us, however, we just used the town of Udawalawe as a stepping stone to our next destination. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen our Yala National Park video, we did see elephants there, so we decided to skip Udawalawe National Park. We mentioned we used it as a stepping stone to our next adventure, and that was a stay in a jungle treehouse at a very remote place called Ahaspo. 
Cunha. This was a blissful retreat that is completely off the beaten path in terms of touristy things to do in Sri Lanka. Considering we are currently hiking just to get to our accommodation, this is gonna be quite the adventure. Even the locals we talked to in Udevalave had never heard of this place and we had an unbelievable few days here. Again, we created a full video about our Haspakuni experience, so if you're interested in seeing us get woken up at 2 a.m. to the sound of elephants stomping around our treehouse, then you will certainly enjoy that video. From Ahaspokunya, we took yet another public bus northwards towards the quaint little village of Ella, the home of one of Sri Lanka's most famous tourist attractions. Before we talk about the main attraction here, we want to give you a heads up on the layout and where to stay. A lot of the scenic accommodation you will find around Ella is up a very steep, narrow road that has lots of options to stay, eat and drink. There is also a shortcut to the top of that steep road via the train tracks and after initially getting a tuk-tuk to our accommodation, our favourite way of getting down and up from Ella town to eat and that kind of thing was to walk along the train tracks. But just be careful. They are live train tracks, so don't be putting your earphones in and forgetting that you're walking on train tracks. As long as you keep an eye open and uh, listen for the blaring horn of the train passing through the village, you'll be fine. It's pretty safe, to be fair. Yeah, the trains don't go very often and all the locals do it, so... And you will know there'll be a big blaring horn sounding through the whole town when the trains are coming through to say... Cool. Get, get the fuck <laughs> off the tracks, pretty much, so you'll be fine. We chose to go with Ella Alpine Resort and really enjoyed our stay. What we liked most about this place was the view from the balcony. Every morning you will enjoy a delicious Sri Lankan breakfast looking out over the valley that lies below Little Adam's Peak, which is also visible when the morning fog clears. So, let's get to why everyone comes to Ella. Nine Arches Bridge is undoubtedly the main attraction here and it is within walking distance from the town center. As always in these videos, we are of course going to suggest arriving as early as you can. Even though we were the first people to arrive, it wasn't long before it was pretty busy with tourists. When you get there, our suggestion is to cross the bridge and then head down this small narrow path through the bushes to get down beneath the bridge itself. If you go down there, it is likely you'll have the place to yourself and be able to take some nice pictures like this. Another great experience about coming here is watching a train traverse the valley over the iconic bridge. We spent around an hour and a half there and in that time we managed to witness two trains passing through, one coming from each direction. This is definitely a hot spot for tourists, but it is insanely beautiful and without doubt worth going to. In terms of places to eat in Ella, do not miss a place called Jade Green. The curry here was unreal. Up until we got to Ella, 99% of our journeys had been on public public buses or tuk-tuks, but this is where it all changes. Forget about buses for a while because train journeys through the central highlands of Sri Lanka are absolutely breathtaking. None more so than the journey between Ella and Nuwara Elia, which is often touted as one of the most scenic train rides in the world. As the train gains altitude, the landscape transforms into a sea of tea estates, with neatly trimmed rows of tea bushes stretching as far as the eye can see. We did see Nuwara Ele, but we actually got the train to Nanu Oya, which is situated around 10 minutes from Nuwara Ele. This whole area is famous for being the main hub for tea plantations. To see the tea making process firsthand, we took a trip to a Pedro tea estate just outside Nuwara Ele. We paid around 1 euro 50 for a quick tour of the factory and working areas. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to film inside to keep the privacy of the workers and enjoyed a cup of tea followed by a stroll through the tea estates. There were mixed reviews on Google about this little tour, but to be honest, we really enjoyed it and we really don't understand why it's anyone would leave a bad review for a tour that cost one year 50 and they would show you all the process. It was fun. It was very informative. Our guide was lovely and very well informed. And even though the whole experience only lasted about 20 to 25 minutes, 
It was great value for money and we just can't imagine having any complaints about it. It was great. To explore Navarro Alley, we decided to stay near the train station at Nano Oya and it was really convenient because we could take a bus to Navarro Alley and back and we stayed at this hotel called Dream Stay Green and it was surrounded by beautiful green tea terraces so we really enjoyed it. From Nano Oya, we took yet another scenic train right northward towards Gambola. We know we say our accommodation is great quite a lot, but this place really must be the best place to stay when you want to explore Ambuluwawa Tower. Don't worry, it took us a few times to say that correctly as well. Ambuluwawa Tower. There, we have it. From the minute Yashoda and Shashika met us at the train station, they really couldn't do enough for us. We had a lovely clean room, a delicious dinner at their guest house, and also also organized a trip to the tower with them. So, Ambuluwawa Tower, what exactly is it? Well, this uniquely designed tower incorporates elements of various religious and cultural traditions. It is a symbol of Sri Lanka's multicultural heritage and celebrates Buddhist, Hindu, Islamic and Christian traditions reflecting the country's diverse religious landscape. If heights give you the heebie-jeebies, then climbing all the way to the top of Ambuluwawa Tower will likely send your heart racing. When you reach the top, you will enjoy 360 degree views of Sri Lanka's central plains. So it really is worth the somewhat dodgy climb up to the top. A visit to this place was a really fun thing to do and it was helped by our amazing hosts who made everything so simple for us. We loved it. From Gambola station you will be able to buy a ticket to get to the big city of Kandy and from there you will need to hop on a bus to take you to Dambula. The Dambula cave temple in Sri Lanka blew us away with its ancient charm and spiritual aura making it a must visit spot. Stepping into its ancient chambers, we were captivated by the beautifully preserved statues and intricate paintings dating back over 2000 years. The serene atmosphere and rich history made our visit here very special, as it was something we have never seen before. Right next to the cave temple stands the massive golden Buddha statue. We would definitely recommend stopping off in Dambula on your way to or from Sigiriya, as these two places are well worth a visit. So, Sigiriya, where do we start? Well, first thing is first, to get there we took a short public bus ride from Dambula and checked into our accommodation at a lovely little hotel called Shen Residence. There are two hikes that are worth doing here. Number one is the hike to the top of Lion Rock and number two is the hike to the top of Pijurangala, which looks across at Lion Rock. Both hikes should be done early in the morning to avoid the afternoon heat. On our first morning we set off walking towards the entrance of Lion Rock. Lion Rock in Sigira is a UNESCO World Heritage Site that is famous for the ancient rock fortress that exists at the top of the spectacular rock that rises dramatically from the surrounding plains. This fortress served as a royal palace and Buddhist monastery over 1,500 years ago. The site is known for its remarkable architecture, including a massive lion-shaped gateway and breathtaking views from the summit. So here we are standing on the top of the line rock in Sigiria and it took us only 20 minutes to go up. It's very steep so you're definitely going to be sweating but it's short so don't you worry. A lot of tourists that we met in Sri Lanka decide to skip this part because they think it's pricey. It's $30 for foreign tourists, it's 30 cents for locals. But I myself was twice in Sri Lanka and I did this gear hike twice and it's really really worth it. Where else would you see this ancient city on the top of the rock? It's incredible, you just have to do this. Definitely one of the best things to do in Sri Lanka, 100%. Don't skimp out, do it. Put your feet up for the rest of the day because you will be doing something very similar the following morning. We suggest getting to the entrance of Pujurangala around 5.30 a.m. to make sure you are up for the sunrise. Once again, this is around a 20 to 30 minute hike. Most of it is stepped until near the top, but there is a little bit of navigating over some large boulders that makes this hike a wee bit more physically demanding than yesterday morning's adventure. The reward is no less impressive, especially if you are up before the sun breaks through. You will 
not be alone up there as this is a very popular thing for tourists to do but it is absolutely worth it as we're leaving now it's almost empty but sunrise experience is really worth it the crowds don't really make it any less spectacular. The combination of these two hikes gives you an amazing perspective of Lion's Rock, so if you're planning a trip to Sri Lanka, Sigiri is one of the first places we would say not to miss. That leaves us with our final destination of this incredible trip, and I suppose there is no better way to finish than with a journey to one of the oldest inhabited cities in the world, the ancient city of Anuradhapura. Firstly, we need to apologize as we don't have a recommendation on the place to stay here because accidentally we stayed in a shithole. So we can't recommend any of you lovely people to stay there. This ancient city is massive. If you think you can walk there, uh, you cannot. You need some sort of vehicle. You can rent a bicycle or a scooter. One negative thing we have to say about this place is that they charge foreigners $25 to have a roam around the city when Sri Lankans can come and go as they please. We are far from stingy and have spent a fortune on our travels and don't mind paying for attractions, but things like that just creates unnecessary division in our opinion. Aren't we all the same? No. Anyway, we rented a scooter from our accommodation that shall remain unnamed, but at least their moped worked. We drove around all the ancient sites, including Ruan. Holy fuck. <laughs> building when it was built was the second biggest structure in the world only behind the great pyramid of Giza which is really impressive the most fascinating place we went in the ancient city was Sri Mahabodai this sacred fig tree is believed to be the oldest recorded tree in the world and it was planted from a cutting of the original Bodai tree under which the Buddha attained enlightenment Anuradhapura served as the capital of the country for over a millennium from the 4th century BC and remains a living testament to Sri Lanka's rich cultural heritage and religious traditions. In our opinion, this was the perfect place to finish our Sri Lankan adventures and all that was left for us to do was to get back to Nagumbo on the train and get started on our next adventure. So to conclude, Sri Lanka goes down as one of our favorite countries we ever visited. And if you want to do this itinerary, it will take you about three to four weeks, depending on how much time you want to spend down south on the beaches. We were in Sri Lanka for most of October and November, but that's because we spent about a month down south, just enjoying the beach vibes, but you don't have to spend that long down there. On this particular trip, we avoided the north and east of the country because that is what is known as northeast monsoon season in Sri Lanka. The southwest monsoon season brings rain to the southwest part of Sri Lanka from May until September, so that's something you'd want to consider when uh, planning and booking your trip. In the meantime, we've been Mark and Asa, and if you come to Sri Lanka and you'll follow our itinerary, we are sure you're going to have something to remember, just like us. <laughs>